unconditional love that you show us, that you give us in your mercy and your grace, Lord. I just pray for our Father that as we sing those words, that we're not just singing words, Lord, but they're coming from our heart. That we know, Lord, that you are faithful to your word and we're holding on to your promises, Lord. And Father God, I just pray this morning for this message. I pray that your word will be spoken and your word will be heard and will be lived out. You know, we're continuing a, uh, a message series I call, we're calling uh, Who Do You Think You Are? And it's funny because uh, in our next message series, and I just, want to, I just want you to kind of look forward to where we're going with this, is going to be basically my story. And, and the, the name of the, the message series, My Story, and I mean your story, not my story, is asking the basic question of this. Is your story worth telling? You, you know, is your story worth telling to others? Is your story worth being repeated in heaven? You know, that's the thing that when we look at our lives, you know, I want, I don't know about you, but, you know, and I've said this so many different times. Um, let, I'm going to let you guys talk for a second. And I want to ask this question. And, and minus the death of someone, um, like your child or, or spouse or something like that. You know, um, let me ask you a question. What do you think some of the worst things that people go through? Just off the top of your head. Lost a job or divorce. Great. Incarceration. Incarceration, yeah, being locked up. Starvation. Starvation. Yeah, I use that other than that one, death of a child, but that's tough. Addiction. Addiction is a terrible place. Anyone else? Come on, guys. Early group, just like disease, loss of reputation. Loss of reputation, disease. Betrayal of a friend. Betrayal of a friend. Being hated. Being hated? Yeah, that's a tough one. Loss of a home. Loss of a home. Displacement. Yeah. I didn't a home, but I people living in there. Yeah, you got you know, yeah, you lost your house to other people. Yeah. That that can happen, uh, definitely. Um, you know, as as you think about this, I just want you to think just just think with me in the sense of what the mission and the purpose of this church is, the mission and purpose um, of what the scriptures teaching us. Um, I really honestly book, could could provide a case that the Bible teaches and uh, that the two worst things that can happen to a, to a human being are this. Number one, that they never have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Never have a relationship with Christ. Christ has provided both eternal life that begins now in our lives today and our, in, our, in our lives for eternity. And, you know, somebody can get into an argument, well, I don't even believe in God, I don't even believe in eternity, I don't believe in all that stuff. Well, that's fine. If you don't, you don't. And, I, and, and you know, I think it's going to, you know, take the power of God to change that in your personal life. But the thing about it is, let's just imagine for a second, all bets off. You're just saying, okay, well, based on the fact that that is the truth, and that really is the truth, yeah, that would be the worst thing that ever happened. If somebody spent their entire life not knowing Jesus Christ. Not having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, I, the second thing I believe is the biggest tragedy in, the, in human humanity, the biggest tragedy in any human's life is to never know and understand why God made it. Their purpose. See, to me, I can't even imagine having a going back to my life before Jesus Christ and forever never having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, I can never imagine not knowing why I'm created. Why do I exist? Why do I take up air? Why do I wake up every morning? Why? 
See, to me, that's the two biggest tragedies in your life. Because I can tell you this right now. When you talk about addiction and the things that drive, like that are incarceration and, and what would drive someone to, to, why would someone get in that position? It always goes back to, I think, two basic principles. Not knowing Jesus Christ as the Savior and not knowing why they're created. Because when we don't know those things, our compass of life just goes spinning. And we're, we're liable to go in any and every direction. We're liable to try anything and everything. Whether it be relationships, whether it be jobs, whether it be trying to make all kinds of money. You know, you take a guy like uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, they're, they're talking a lot about him right now. This guy had all the money. He needed it. Wanted. He could walk down to the ATM machine and buy and get any amount of money he wanted to buy any amount of heroin he needed. What makes that person do? Okay, you say, well, if I just make a little bit of money. Well, he had it all. Still wasn't that. Still wasn't fulfilled. You talk about, well, if I could just have a child. Well, I know a lot of mothers that are that are not happy. They got lots of kids. <laughs> See, I don't know if I just need the right man. Well, I'll tell you what, my wife met the right man and she's not happy. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw myself out there. I, 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 I got, I'm a big man, I can handle that. But seriously, guys, I'm telling you, if you, you think about all those different tragedies in life, and I'm going to tell you something, they don't, they pale in comparison to not knowing Jesus and not knowing why <coughs> He made me. Why am I on this planet? Why do I do this? Those two things right there answer the two basic, biggest questions in every single human being's life. That's why this church exists. That's why this pastor exists. That's why we do what we do. Is to help people come to, to the relationship with Jesus Christ and then to, to find out why am I why do I live? Why am I existing? What, what, what does it mean to become a fully to fully committed, fully devoted follower of Christ? See, the answer, the, 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 the number thing, number one thing that I want to talk to you, the first point I want to share with you is number one, you were created to serve God. You were created to serve God. To bring him glory. To be to, to have him live his lived out his power, his authority, his gifting, his everything. He made you for the purpose to serve him. This is the scripture. I love this. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, that word workmanship means one. It can be translated into the word in the original language is one. And this is what I believe that God wants to do. God wants to use your life to create a poem, a story. A story of His glory lived out in your life. You know, I, I look back over it and I think to myself, I love to sit down and tell the story of God of what He's done in my life. Sometimes I'll go take, take guys, we'll go fishing, and, 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 and in that, you know, guys are always telling stories. And somewhere in that opportunity, I get to tell a story about what God really has done in my life. I Man, I tell people a lot of times the story of driving up into Port St. Lucie with nothing but a, a $75 and a U-Haul truck. And watch God give us a, a place to live, provide us a home, and provide us jobs and resources and things like that. Man, I love to read, uh, when I live, read, literally read uh, what I read about uh, Abraham, I think to myself, that is a cool way to live. Just to trust God. But see, the number one factor, the biggest thing that keeps you from living that life, the biggest thing that keeps you from doing what God really created you to do, the one thing that keeps you from doing the why is fear. <coughs> You're afraid. Well, if I give it all to God, if I trust God, then somehow I'm going to be shipped off the hay. <laughs> I know a guy that just 
I mean, he had his family here and he was looking forward to being home, but there was a part of it that he said, man, I'm leaving and he hated it. And it's just the thing about it is, is listen guys, fear will keep you from fulfilling God's purpose for your life. And I know, you know, I hear it, I mean, it's just like I, I hear people, I'm not afraid of anything. I want to tell you something. I really believe that most every one of you in this room, I would almost say it gets up into the 90% are afraid of what God would do with your life if you would just let them. Just let them. See, the thing about it is, most of you who come here week after week after week, see, you're fine with Coming here week after week after week. You know the songs that we're going to probably sing. You know the message that I'm probably going to preach. You've been hearing it for years. See, I've got a guy in my life right now, and, 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 and I'm building a relationship with him. And one of these days, not too long from now, maybe a week or so, maybe some of the first time guests, maybe you're going to be like this, this guy. He's going to walk through that door, and when he does, there's going to be a little knot of fear in his heart, in his stomach, because he's going to go, what are they going to do in here? What are they going to say? Are they going to be one of those, you know, he's going to flop on the ground? What? <laughs> we had some people this morning in church, they showed up. Everybody's wearing bathing suits. They got cover-ups on and stuff like that. And I go, where are y'all going? Well, we come to church. We're heading to the beach. Right I'm like, that is cool. And that's the church. I love it. I, I like a church. You can dress the beach. Or the boat. I'm going snook fishing afterwards. I thought I'd hang out here with you guys. And now they have snook fishing. Fine. Have a good time. I'll bring you some, you know, bring a play. But, uh, he's going to be a little bit knotted up. He's going to be a little... Nervous. What's this church going to be like? What's this going to be like? And he's going to come. That's going to be his first step of faith. But when that's all you do week after week after week, and you call yourself a child of God, you need to go back and re-kind of ask yourself, where am I? Where am I? And it is all that there is to me is just coming and sitting and listening and coming and sitting and listening. Of course you're not afraid of that. No wonder you're not. You're used to it. I think it's time for some of you to get off your can and get out there and let God use you back to the point where there's some nervousness that builds back up in your stomach because you're afraid of what God's going to do, what He's going to, you know, you, it, this, this fear, I, I understand it. I'm not saying it's a healthy thing. But I understand where this fear comes from. This fear comes from Satan. See, Satan uses this tool of fear to try to keep you from doing what God wants you to do. But there's a sign of it. If you're getting a fear, then you are actually in the right place where you need to be. Because, see, Satan, if he ain't giving you some fear, you're in the wrong place. You're doing the wrong things. Right now, I'm telling you, man, in my ministry, God is putting me in places right now. I just scared me to death. God's putting me in some ministry positions where I'm a little bit more of an executive field. And I, that scares me. I'm a do-it-yourself do it yourself kind of guy. I like to get involved. I just think, I look at the ceiling and think, me and Brad, we sanded this thing down together. We were doing it together. That's where I belong. That's where I feel. But it, would, it, would just, it's, it just bothers me to be the guy walking and say, hey, listen, this all needs to be sanded. You guys get this done, I'll be back. Because I've got other things to do. That's not, my, that's not my personality. That's not where I come from. But that seems to be where God is putting me more and more. Other ministries where, where God's putting me in more of an executive field. Do I, does that make me scared? Yeah, it scares me to death. But I know that fear is coming from Satan. Where I need to be, I know that tool of that fear is Satan. What I need to be doing is trusting God more. Because God, in 2 Timothy, I love this, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. See, God wants to overcome that fear that I have where He's putting me. And He wants to overcome that with not a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. This next scripture. It's Acts 1-8. This is my life verse. 
This scripture, if you come and visit me at the graveside, you'll see this scripture on my tombstone one of these days. Hopefully not next week. Talk about more in the future. <laughs> two weeks. Yeah, <laughs> two weeks. <laughs> I'm ready. So I told people last week, I said, you know that statement, I was watching John Wayne movie, and they always use those cowboy movies. You, you know, you've got to prepare to meet your maker. And I'm saying, by the time you need to meet your maker, if you haven't already prepared, it's too late. It's already too late. I'm ready to meet my maker. But this Acts 1 8, it says, you will receive power. When? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I remember the moment that I heard that scripture and read that scripture for the very first time in my life. I remember that moment like it was yesterday. I was dealing with fear. I was afraid of the future. I was afraid of the next ministry step that I was going to have to take. I was afraid of all the things that was going on in my life. And in a voice just as like if you were sitting here in this room right now, and you said to me, this word, Acts 1-8, just in that voice, God spoke to my heart, and He said, Acts 1-8. And I went and I opened up my Bible, and God asked me this question, He goes, Have you trusted me as your Savior? And I said, yes. And he says, then you have the Holy Spirit. He lives in your heart. And I'm like, yes. And he goes, you've got all the power you ever need. Trust me. And I jerked up a pregnant wife, sold a house, took a baby 20 years ago. This week, 20 years ago, March 1st, 1994, and left it all and went on this glorious journey that God has had me on for over 24 years. And I don't regret one second. Not one minute. Was I scared? You better leave it. But I knew that was Satan trying to keep me from experiencing all that God wanted me to experience. I said this last week. The biggest tragedy in people's life is not what they suffer. It's what they miss. See, you're going through your life right now and you think this is bad, that's bad, this is bad. Let me tell you what's worse. It's what you're missing out on. That if you would give your life to Christ and trust Him and receive that power that God has intended for you from the very beginning and you would allow Him to use you to serve Him the way He wanted He created you to serve Him, you would be experiencing life that you don't even know about. That you have no even no idea about. That life exists out there away from you and you're missing it because of your own fear. The fear that Satan put in your heart. See, the Spirit of God gives us power. When we put our faith in Christ, we get all the power of our need. You're never going to have to ask God for power. You're never going to need any more power. You've already got all the power you're ever going to need. See, listen, this. God equips each one of us with spiritual gifts. With gifts. Each one of us is given gifts. Now, it's, here's the thing. Is, what's the tra travesty of this is in your fear, many of you don't even use them. Don't even use them. Some of you out there have a, 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 a some extraordinary gifts. Spiritual gifts. I know one of the things that my wife, when someone goes through a really tough time or has a really deep decision to make, I know if my wife's phone will be, it'll be a text. Hey, can you talk? Man, I'm going to tell you something. When you're going through a challenge in life, 
There is nothing better than to grab a mercy. Someone with a spiritual gift of mercy who will sit down with you and listen. Who will listen. When you need to make a decision in your life, man, I tell you what, the first person I grab is I grab a mercy. And I talk to them about it. And they listen. If you have something in your life that you need to get out of your life, and I'm talking about a deep-rooted sin, boy, I call a prophet. Those guys don't give an inch. They'll just tell you straight up, this is what the Word of God says. If you want to be right with God, this is the way you live. It just makes sense to them. Black is black, and white is white. If you need encouragement, man, it's great that God's church has encouragement. That's my deal. I'm an inspirer. I'm here. Mercy solicits to you. The prophet tells you what to do. I'm alongside of you going, you can do it. You can do it. Way to go, water boy. You can do it. <laughs> See, I'm that guy that's just, come on, you can do it. You can do it. But the last thing you want to do is you want to call me and say, hey, Pastor, I need you to organize this. <laughs> I'll be like, Okay, yeah, I'll do it. I'll, I can do this. I can organize it. And then two texts later, you're going, he's not responding. He's not getting back with me. Why isn't he getting back with me? Look at it. Why isn't he getting back with me? Because he's not organized. My gift isn't in organization. My gift is in exhortation. I like to encourage you. I like to get you going. I'm already encouraging somebody else. I forgot about the project you told me to go on. <laughs> See, God equips each of us with gifts that, that He can use in our lives to serve others. So it's not concerning spiritual gifts, brothers. I want you to, to be informed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols. However, you were led before, and I want you to understand that, that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is a curse. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. He says, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but the same God, who empowers them all, all in everyone. See, this is where the power comes from. It comes from God. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the what? My good? My family's good? See, this is the problem with a lot of you guys. My kids are happy. My kids are healthy. Who cares about anybody else? See, you say, I want everyone. This is it. This is this. I love this saying. They say this in Haiti on the mission. Our goal is not to send fat, healthy, happy, educated, clothed Haitians to hell. Our goal is to help Haitians, whether they be healthy or not healthy, whether they be clothed or not clothed, or whether they be fed or not fed, our goal is to help them become to Christ. Because that, remember, what's the number one problem? People not knowing Jesus. And then, then help them to find their purpose, in, in Christ's purpose in their life. Then, we work on, I mean, but now we use the tools of feeding and education because that are those are basic needs. But if the end result is just to get clothes on them, if the end result is just to get food around them, if the end result is just to get them educated, then we wasted it. And see, that's the same way with this church. That's the same problem with it. This is the problem with this church. As long as my kids are going to heaven, as long as my kids are, are growing in Jesus, then who cares about our place? Who cares about the homeless? Who cares about anyone else that needs, that needs Jesus? See, that's where we've got to work beyond this. That's what God wants us to do. God wants us to get outside and use our gifts, not just to influence what's going on in our family, but what? The common good. The common good is very obvious. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Matthew 28, 19 20 says this. That it is, for God says this, go make disciples of all the nations. Not our nation. 
all the nations. That was ironic. We had a, a booth set up at downtown Fort Pierce. And, there, and, and, and one of the things that the girl said that, that happened was that people would come up and say, you don't want to go to Haiti. There's a lot of killing down there and kidnapping down there and, and all this stuff. And then I, I didn't, I'm glad I wasn't there at that time because I would say, you know, I said, you know where Fort Pierce ranks in the United States? Number 57. You got 75,000 people in this town and you rank 57 in the United States on murder? Don't tell me not to go to Haiti. We've got it here. We've got it everywhere. The common good has to go in our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, and the outer parts of the world. Everywhere. It's just, you can't, you can't just say this goes in one place. It goes everywhere. There's opportunity to serve right next door. Man, God's really opened up the door for our family to minister. I'm going to tell you something. You guys say I, 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 I want you to finish this statement. My neighbors are... Finish. My neighbors are... Great. How many of you can finish this statement? My neighbor is a... Paranoid schizophrenic. Literally. Knock on your door, 1.30 in the morning, somebody's trying to kill me. We're, we're, we, we, let's talk later. <laughs> That's my neighborhood. No joke. Lock down the doors. We've got to make sure the lady is. But this is where our, our families, as a family, we're rolled into an opportunity to minister to this family. To say, hey, listen, we want to help you get help. We want to help you. I told her, I, I got the opportunity to talk for two hours to her. It didn't seem to go anywhere, and that's, that's, that's not always the, the object, but always the whole thing you kept coming back to is you need Jesus in your life. He will take away your fear. I'm telling you guys, this is the mission field. This is the reason we are created. For the common good. And the common good is to share the gospel and love of Jesus Christ with those who need salvation. The life change and purpose. You, come, you leave today. You never come back to this church. Come back to this church in 15 years, and if I'm still the pastor, I'm telling you, I don't care what the title of the message is going to be. You're going to walk through that door. I've known Brad Chantel for 13 years. I'm telling you, ask them. They will tell you the dude has been saying the same thing for 13 years. It never changes. The hope of every single one of you in any need that you have is Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something that's going to happen. You start serving. You start ministering to that, that neighbor who's still you know, dealing with paranoia. You start ministering and loving that person where they are. And what's going to happen is, is a desire to serve more is going to creep into your life and you're going to be more and more and more desirable of going and seeing and doing. John, the first year, John gave so we could go to Haiti. The next year, John was in Haiti. It's that desire, that call. Not to single him out. It's the story that I can tell you about people in this room over and over and over again. John just left and the other John. We had John, both Johns there. John went to Haiti once, and now John practically lives in Haiti. And it can happen anywhere. We got families that go to, are going to Nicaragua. We have different things going on everywhere. 
We have people that are making sandwiches and taking clothes and going and dealing with homeless in Fort Pierce and Fort St. Louis and throughout. You just have to overcome that fear. And when you overcome that fear, the more you desire to serve, and the more you desire, the more God gives you that opportunity. I love this. First Peter 4 11. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength of God, supplies in order that everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Our service to God. God created us to serve. And then what is that service? What's the end product of that service? To make Jesus famous. To make Jesus famous. That's it. God does that work in order to make Jesus famous. You know, when I realize that I've done my job, is I'm obscure, I'm the same, I'm just like every other preacher that's preached Jesus before me, and Jesus is made famous. Made famous. Anything and everything in my life that I can say, man, look, this is what God did. God did. God gave me my place of ministry. God gave me my family. God gave me the friends that I had to, to influence and to be influenced by. God gave me the love that I experienced by people. It's all God. For what purpose? It's all meant to make Jesus famous. To make it famous. You know, I told you earlier in the message, in the message I told you that I'm going into different ministry opportunities and I'm experiencing this anxiety and fear because it's, it's, it's somewhere I've never been before. I'm going to tell you something. You, you think in your head right now, you think, man, it would scare me to death to pack up my stuff in a U-Haul and move to Montana and just start another church. To me, that would be easier than anything I've ever done in my life. Wouldn't even make me even flinch. Sell everything I have, load up my U-Haul, and Montana I go. Matter of fact, I'm probably going to North Dakota. There's a boom up there. People are moving there by the hundreds. And I am here to reach people for Jesus. Well, let me tell you why I don't. Because that's too easy. God wants me to stay put, to glorify Him in other venues, Him to serve, use me in other gifts that I have, to serve people the way He's called me to serve, to glorify and make His Son Jesus famous. And here's the last thing. God knows your weaknesses. And He wants to make you not strong, firm, but in Him. See, I don't plan on getting stronger. I plan on getting weaker and trusting more in Him. Because why? If you get stronger, then you're making yourself famous. But if you're staying weak and God's doing it through you, then who does it make famous? Jesus. The whole plan and the whole purpose is to make Jesus famous. I don't want my face on a billboard. I don't want my name associated with a TV show. I don't trust that. I don't like it. And if you ever come to me and say, hey, you watch your words? I mean, I'll say, no, I don't watch it. Because I think most of their theology is junk. And it's trash. 
And it's teaching America more evil and more disgusting belief than I could ever do. Having a, a bar or anything else. I think it's filth. Because it teaches a health and wealth gospel that is a lie. And it's a stench to the snuff and nostrils of God. And it's making them famous. And it's decreasing Jesus. Not in our It's filth. I'm going to get out there and smile a lot. And tell a lot of happy stories. But I'll tell us the truth. That life I believe lived without Christ is impossible. That's why we turn to addiction, and depression, and anger, and we destroy it. But a life in Christ is empowered. And it makes God famous. It makes Him famous. Let's bow our heads. Every head bow, every eye closed. I asked this question this, this morning in the earlier service. I'm going to pray for us. Father, you know every single person that's in this room. Some I think I know, and some I don't know. But really, in reality, I, I don't know their heart. But you do. And you know what's going on in each person's heart.
and that's what you're genuinely calling them to do, I would help everyone unpack. Because I know the experience that they're going to have in just trusting you is going to be more valuable than anything else they could ever have in their life. Because I know that in what's been in my life. But if you're calling every single one of these people in this room to stay put and to be planted in this church and to be a part of what God's doing here to reach uh, this community, to reach Fort Pierce and the Treasure Coast, to reach Haiti and the other countries, if that's what you're calling to do, then God, I pray that they would trust you and that they would let that fear drop, fall off like drops and that they would let you work in them that Christ can be made famous. Whether they stay or whether they go, whether they talk or whether they remain silent. No matter what you call them to do, that they would do it with a fervency and an obedience, that they would be fully devoted followers of Christ Jesus. And we ask this in your Son, Jesus, holy and precious and powerful and famous name.